Uh, uh, our speaker today is uh, Tim Rothgarten. Uh, Tim was a, a math major at Cornell, then he got a PhD in computer science at Stanford, where he is today, a uh, professor, associate professor of computer science at Stanford. Uh, he's uh, gotten a lot of awards that are kind of name-checking a lot of pioneers. So he's got the Girdle Prize for his work on algorithmic game theory, uh, the Kali Prize, the Shapley Lectureship, the Tucker Prize, the Grace Murray Hopper Award, uh, uh, as well as also a Presidential Early Career Award. He's uh, written a book on selfish routing and the price of anarchy, and he's uh, got a book coming out soon, I guess, next or month. Yep. next month, next month being August, on, uh, I, as I read, uh, on uh, 20 lectures on algorithmic game theory. So he's going to talk today about uh, auctions, and in particular about wireless auctions, and so here he is. Okay. And the summer student here. Oh, his, his, his greatest award, the greatest award, his finest achievement, his yeah. greatest accomplishment was he was a summer intern in K-5-3 in 2001. Indeed. So. so every time I come, I get a little nostalgic because it was really a very fun and productive summer back in 2001. A great, great bunch of interns and a lot of the people at K-5-3 were, were here then. Uh, Ron was here and Nimrod and many other people. And I learned, I learned a lot from them. And so that's sort of, uh, I haven't forgotten. Um, so thanks for coming, happy to be here. Um, so over the past 15 years or so, uh, a lot of computer scientists have started um, learning a lot about game theory and economics. And the original motivation you know, was just to reason about the kinds of applications that were emerging early this century. So after the internet became widespread and increasingly commercialized, just a lot of applications that computer scientists cared about involved interaction between a bunch of strategic participants. Of course, game theory and economics offer a lot of tools to, to think about those problems. But something interesting's happened over the past maybe seven years or so, which is the ideas are increasingly flowing in the opposite direction from computer science to game theory and economics. And so today I want to kind of highlight you know, some of those ideas in the context of the design and analysis of auctions and specifically with a case study of a particular really major auction involving tens of billions of dollars, which is happening literally right now as we speak, uh, and where computer science has, has really brought a lot to the table, both in the design of the auction being run and also in just understanding when these types of auctions work well. Okay, so that's the plan. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about this FCC incentive auction. The story begins about four years ago. That's when Congress authorized the FCC to design and then run a novel auction for reallocating wireless spectrum. Now let me tell you what's not new about this proposal. What's not new is the idea of running an auction, the government running an auction, to sell licenses for wireless spectrum to telecoms and other interested bidders. That idea has been around at least since the early 90s. So what's different now, and the reason a different auction is necessary, is because now all of the really juicy spectrum that people want for emerging wireless broadband technologies are pretty much already accounted for. All the spectrum is already owned by somebody. So to give someone new spectrum, you have to take it away from someone else. And that's exactly the purpose of this auction. It's to take spectrum away from people who are using it in a not very valuable way, like say analog television broadcasting stations, and reallocating it to people who can get much more value out of the spectrum, like uh, wireless telecoms. How do you compensate people who've got it taken away from you? Oh, well, that's, that's what this is all about. Oh, that, that's what this auction is all about. Okay? I'm your straight man, Steve. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the setup. Okay, so, this is an auction that's really a double auction. It has what's called a reverse part and what's called a forward part. So a reverse auction, you know, that's when the person running the auction wants to buy something. So like when you try to hire a contractor to work on your house and you go get bids, you're basically running a reverse auction. Forward auction, that's when you're running an auction to sell something. When you put something on eBay, that's a forward auction. So the way this FCC incentive auction works is there's two stages, a reverse stage. This is where the government actually compensates people, buys back these licenses from current owners, again, principally television broadcasters. And then there's a forward auction where they turn around and basically flip those licenses uh, to people who can use them. So put people like Verizon, AT&T, uh, and so on. Okay, so there's the reverse stage and subsequently the forward stage where you sell. 
Now, um, the numbers involved, our estimates are pretty big. So I'm listing some sort of old estimates here by the Congressional Budget Office. It's increasingly clear that the real numbers are going to be only higher than this. But the original estimates is that it would, it would cost in total $15 billion to compensate uh, television stations for enough licenses uh, to be useful, and that you, know, you could turn around and make $40 billion in the forward auction, selling them to telecoms and other interested parties. So that's a pretty big spread, right? That's a $25 billion spread. And so the hope was to, uh, the, the bill proposes to use that not just to cover the auction costs, um, but you know, also to fund some new services and reduce the deficit, presumably part of why you know, it was one of those rare pieces of legislation that's actually been you know, passed by Congress in recent years. In fact, pro it probably didn't hurt that the, that the bill was called the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. I mean, this is a bill that just authorizes the FCC to do this double auction, that's what it's called. Because you know, who's gonna vote against the you know, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act? Is it really any kind of tax relief for job creation? Well, so, you know, presumably the, the deficit reduction feeds into that in some way. So, or at least the tax relief part. So, Okay, so the plan for the talk is I want to talk about each of these two stages in turn. So first, the reverse auction. And reverse auction, let me emphasize, this is the part that's totally new. There's literally never been an auction of this type in this domain and, and, and with spectrum licenses anywhere in the world. It's happening for the first time. I actually just concluded about a month ago. Uh, and so here I'm going to show you how computer science has really directly influenced which auction was implemented. Okay, really directly influenced the design of this auction that was, that was developed over the past few years. The second half of the talk I'll move on to the forward auction where you're selling these licenses back to telecom companies. So like I said, these forward auctions have been being run for a long time, since the early 90s, before computer scientists were really engaging in computer science and, uh, in economics and game theory. But still, on the forward auction side, I'll show you how the theoretical computer science toolbox is perfectly suited to make precise, to make rigorous, some rules of thumb about the practice of forward auctions that have been known to practitioners, known to economists for years, but left unformalized until just the last few years. Okay? But, so let's begin with the reverse auction. Let me show you uh, how computer science has contributed here. All right, so let me tell you how this works. Okay, this, this, will, this will be a few slides to tell you all the relevant details of how the reverse auction works. So again, remember what, what's the point. The point is the government is trying to buy licenses from those who already have them, principally television broadcasters. That's the point of this auction. Now, presumably the government on the one hand wants to buy up a lot of these licenses, so there's a lot of spectrum to resell. On the other hand, they don't want to pay an exorbitant cost. So the auction is meant to balance those two tensions. And so the, the auction design was proposed by two economist colleagues of mine, Paul Milgram and Ilya Segal. And it's what's called a descending clock auction. And this can be thought of as an extension of previous work in both the economics and computer science literatures. And uh, the main point of a descending clock auction is to make it as easy as possible to participate in the auction. So that if you're a bidder, if you're one of these television stations, it should be as obvious as possible how to participate in the auction. So how is this implemented? Well, if you're one of these bidders, if you're one of these TV stations in the auction, in a given round, the auction will proceed in rounds, in a given round, you're gonna be given an offer, a buyout offer. So it'll say something like, you know, would you be willing to accept $50 million in exchange for the license that you have? Yes or no? And in a given round, this is the only question that a bidder has to answer. Yes or no at some given offer price, like $50 million. So now if the bidder says no, I would not sell my license for $50 million, then that bidder is kicked out of the auction for the rest of, for the rest of time. Okay, so this, this station, the station at the end of the day will not, the government will not buy its license and it will not be compensated, it will have no payment. Question? You're not offering specifically to that one person, right? It's you are actually. No, this is an interesting point. It's actually personalized offer prices. Oh. Yeah, so. And what basis do you decide to offer different amounts? To yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that, yeah. So there's this interesting, there's, there's sort of an unusual price discrimination aspect, which if you think about it, you know, makes a lot of sense. You know, like CBS in New York is not going to be the same as, you know, some podunk station in Wyoming, right? So you really, it's kind of clear you need some way to do price differentiation. But well, I'll give you more details a little bit later. So, so that's the, so as a bidder, you decide yes or no at a given offer price. If you say no, then you're out. Okay, you just you get to keep your license and you don't participate at all in the reverse in the reverse auction. Now, if you say yes, I would be willing to sell for fifty million. 
That doesn't necessarily mean that the government will buy your license and pay you 50 million. It just means you can continue in the auction. So in the next round, it might well be that the auction comes back and says, well, you know what, we don't actually need your license that badly, uh, so we don't want to pay 50 million. Would you also be willing to accept 45 million? And again, you can say yes or no. And again, if you say no, you're kicked out of the auction forever. If you say yes, you get to stay in. So what's the motivation of somebody not to say yes all the time, or at least for some time? R right. So at some point, the price will be so low, it's just not, I mean, you're not willing to sell. I mean, you have some personal value for this license. So in the whole point, I said this auction was meant to be extremely easy to participate in. So the obvious way to participate is you just, um, so the hard part is you think about what is the lowest offer you'd be willing to accept? You know, that's not so an easy question, but it's a well-defined question. You figure it out. Given that answer, it's obvious what you do. You keep saying yes until the offer goes below that threshold, and then you say no. And he said, you're kicked out for all time. For all time probably means just today. Is there maybe a new auction? For this it's auction. Maybe. Yeah, it's not. There probably will be another auction like this sometime, but it's probably also years. You know, years. So it's, it's very uncertain when the next opportunity of this one will be. You know, if you had a, I think if you were happy to take a risk over a five to ten year time frame, that would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, it's not obvious you would be compensated more later than you would now, but perhaps, you know, perhaps it would be scarcer, the television um, spectrum. So, you, it, you know, you could do that. You could gamble on a better opportunity 10 years from now, but it, it would be risky. So, you know, I think, you know, the mental model you want to have is, you know, someone who maybe, you know, so a lot of these broadcasters, you know, uh, you, again, they're sort of an, this, is, this is analog we're talking about. So the reach of a lot of these broadcasters is very small. So when you're talking about, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars, it's pretty attractive. So there's, there's a lot of, lot of interest. Good. Okay. So that's, how, that's, that, so that's, that's a high-level bit of how it works. So each bidder sees a descending sequence of prices, and you keep saying yes or no. When you say no, you get kicked out. When the auction terminates, and that's, it's a little tricky to explain when it terminates. I'll talk about that in detail. When it terminates, at that point, all of the bidders still in the auction, the government will buy all of their licenses at the price equal to the most recently, i.e. lowest, accepted buyout offer. Okay, so that's what happens at the end. By that guy, for that guy. By that guy, right. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, as was, as was mentioned, you know, different people will, off, will face different prices. So in particular, the, the beginning offer is, is wildly different for different participants. So, so for, I mean, so they're all very high, the opening offers, because, uh, uh, you know, for this to be successful, you obviously need a lot of broadcasters to participate. So they begin with these very lucrative opening offers, which basically everybody's happy to accept. By participating in this auction, you're under contract to sell your license if, if the price never drops below that opening offer. And the highest is, is, in fact, WCBS in New York. It was $900 million opening offer for WCBS, which is kind of actually an insane, an insane amount of money. Um, and again, obviously, ones in Wyoming are going to be offered much lower prices, okay? And so at termination, it's whatever your most recent price off offer price was. That's what you get paid for your license at termination. Just on the, for a particular piece of the spectrum, uh, how many, it's different in New York and Wyoming, so they, uh, somebody in Wyoming and someone in New York have that same piece of the spectrum? Yes, yes we'll, get, yes, we'll get to that. So basically, a license is for a particular channel, which is a particular uh, block of spectrum for a particular region. So two broadcasters that have non-overlapping broadcast regions will have the same portion of the spectrum. And we'll see pictures of that in a, in a couple slides. Are you going to also say how that initial price is set? Uh, I can say a little bit about it. I mean, so there is a formula, and the formula is public. Uh, I mean, so basically, the so there's two things which govern that opening price. The first is just the size of the market, so, so the, the extent of your reach. The second is a sort of rough proxy for how much you're, sort of for how constrained you are. So, so think of it as like, you look at the number of different people that you overlap with, and so that means buying you out would give me a lot more flexibility with what I do with other people. So then I'll also give you a higher offer if somehow buying you out would just make my whole life easier because, of, because you conflict with so many different people. So imagine you conflicted with like 10 different stations, so all of you, you, know, you have to have a different channel from all of them, you know, then I'm also gonna offer you a higher price. And there's some so-called so square root rule to kind of combine these two criteria. So, so, so the value of analog licenses probably goes down over time? 
So, so if everybody else sells and I keep my analog license, probably not that many people are going to have a you know, TV that's... Possibly, yeah. So, well, actually, so a big, re so a big part of the value uh, of these licenses is, is if you have an analog broadcasting license, it actually oh, forces okay. cable to also carry your channel, to carry uh, your broadcast. Okay. So it has value, which is not necessarily obvious. I, I, I don't really know if the value is going to go up or down after this auction. I kind of... I thought we shut down all the analog TV a couple years ago. Uh, only past channel 51. So we still have people 51 and below. Yeah. Yeah. And digital is just a whole different story. There's no bidding, nothing. It's just something goes over a pipe somewhere. Digital stuff is totally orthogonal. This is totally orthogonal. orthogonal. All right. So digital is totally orthogonal. Right. So, but again, all these analog broadcasters, you know, so you, in principle, you could view them analog, but very few people do, right? So most people will see it through the digital signal. And again, if you have one of these analog licenses, then you, you have to be granted a right. But like here in the Bay Area, all yeah. the major stations, analog stations went offline. They're not, not there anymore. Um, okay. We can talk about this offline. Okay. So, yeah. Um, good. Okay. So let me tell you more about how this stops. Okay. So what happens each round is you say yes or no, and then you know, the, in some sense, the government wants to keep lowering these prices, but it wants to clear enough spectrum. So what does it mean to clear enough spectrum? Well, so you know, getting back to Ron's question of what does spectrum actually look like, this will help me sort of explain what the stopping rule is. Um, so each of the channels, and we're thinking of UHF channels here, they occupy six megahertz of the spectrum. And an, an item, a license, that's the right to broadcast on a particular channel in a particular area. Okay? And so, so what does it mean to clear enough spectrum? So the goal is going to be to free up you know, some target number of channels and to do it nationwide. Okay, so for example, channel 51, you want to buy out everybody on channel 51 nationwide. Okay, so you really want nationwide clearance for it to be as useful as possible to the potential bidders, many of whom are thinking about implementing national plans uh, with this, newly, this new spectrum. Now, you, so the government's not just going to want to clear one channel, it's going to want to clear many. Uh, and so there's some, you know, it's, it's unclear right now how many are going to get cleared. Um, you know, but for the sake of the talk, you know, let's imagine that they wanted to clear 10 channels, so 60 megahertz. And maybe they pick, say, you know, the upper 14 channels, 38 to 51. So it turns out the, the higher channels are the ones that are more useful for um, wireless broadband. So they might say, okay, out of these top 14 channels, let's clear 10 of them nationwide. That gives us 60 megahertz to work with when we pass to the forward auction and sell it back. Okay. Clear means covering in every territory. Say it again? Clear a channel to clear it. Yeah, it means nationwide, everywhere. Thing, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's sort of how you should think of the goal. Okay. So from the top 14 channels, you know, let's free up 10 of them. Okay. But so now we get to a, a really interesting part of the auction, which is okay. So again, remember we're trying to clear nationwide, but you know we're just we're decreasing prices in this auction. At some point, different people will drop out of the auction, which means we don't get to buy their license. It means they keep their license. And it seems very unlikely that these television broadcasters are going to neatly arrange dropping out in a way that just magically clears an entire channel nationwide and then the next channel nationwide. That's not what's going to happen, right? Channel 49 in San Francisco will drop out. Then channel 39 in Austin will drop out. Then channel 42 in Boston, and so on. So how, how, so how do you deal with this? How do you deal with the fact that you're just going to get these pockmarked dropouts from the spectrum? So here there's a major centralized step in the auction. And it's really sort of the part of this process which you can't really imagine being done by a free market. It seems like you really need some kind of centralized coordination device like this auction to do this, is there's going to be a repacking, i.e. a reassignment of channels. So if you're one of these television broadcasters and you have the right to channel 49 before the auction, even if you drop out of the auction, if you drop out of the auction, you're guaranteed to retain your license, you are not guaranteed to retain your channel. You might be reassigned from, say, 41 to 49, okay? So, again, even if you don't, even, you know, and there's sort of minimal compensation if you have a channel reassignment, but it's at a much lower level uh, than for buying out, buying, out, uh, buying out your license, okay? If I'm channel five yeah. and, uh, and I give up my, uh, my spectrum, 
But I still want to keep Channel 5, it's just I get assigned to a new spectrum and people's TV sets will somehow magically know the new spectrum. I don't quite get how that works. Um, so, I mean, there'd be a new, so I mean, there'd be a new list of channels, basically. So, you know, who's on a given channel would just be different. It so, would be me updated. as a consumer, I would notice a difference then. I would notice that... Yeah, you, you would be told that, you know, here's the new assignment of channels. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. So, I'm told that ABC is now on channel 8 instead of channel 7. Exactly. Yeah, but some channels are disappearing. Right. Oh, yeah. It's not like all of them are being used. That's right. Right. That's right. So there's going to be a mixture. Some of these channels really will disappear. Some of them really will be will assign, uh, reassign. There's, a, there's actually some intermediate options that bidders can, can take, which I'm not going to really mention, which is they can share channels. Two stations can share a channel. Or you can just agree um, you know, to have kind of other types of partial service. But well, let's just think of it as binary. Like you either keep your license or not. I mean, let's say I'm the guy in Wyoming and you're the guy in New York with the same spectrum. Right. I, and the guy in Wyoming wants to drop out. I can imagine the guy in New York saying, look, don't drop out. I want to keep this whole thing alive. I'll, I'll give you some money sure. if you stay alive. Sure. So, I mean, there's an issue of collusion. Right. <coughs> which, so it's illegal. So it's, it's illegal? not It's illegal. Yeah. So if you engage in it, you know, and the government finds out, they'll, they'll prosecute you for it. That said, I'm sure some degree of collusion does happen, um, and it's you know with, it's it's sort of a you know in auction design is it's there's basically no reasonable auction design which is fully robust to collusion with side payments. So the usual way you handle this is you make you know you, you, you do the auction format as best you can, and then you use use the legal system to you know really <coughs> sort of try to try to prevent large scale collusion. Okay. Right, so when I say clear 10 channels out of the top 14, I really mean something a little more subtle nationwide. So what I mean is you wanna buy back enough licenses from the top 14 channels so that the stations you did not buy back, buy out, can be repacked, reassigned on just four channels, okay? Nationwide, so you want 10 clear nationwide, four can be full nationwide after you do a suitable channel reassignment, okay? So that's the repacking problem. Okay, so given that there's a collection of stations that you have not bought out that keep their licenses, reassign them to channels so they use as few channels as possible. And if you think about it, so let me just point out, you're gonna have to solve this, these kinds of repacking problems over and over and over again in this auction design. Let's go back to, you know, we talked about how, you know, at some point if you're a bidder, your offer might be lowered from 50 million to 45 million, at which point you can now say no and be kicked out of the auction, okay? And if you think about it from the auction's perspective, that means you've got to be a little careful before you lower anybody's buyout offer. Right, so suppose you're offering someone 50 million, they're willing to be bought out, and there's some collection of stations which are not bought out, which you can successfully repack in your target, say, four channels. Now, if you drop this guy's offer from 50 to 45, he might drop out. So that's one more station you have to repack, and this could be the pivotal station which suddenly causes you to need five channels to um, reassign everybody rather than four. And if your target's four, that's not gonna be acceptable. Okay, so the auction's gonna maintain the invariance that the stations which have dropped out can be repacked into a target number of channels. If there's any station which whose dropout would violate that invariant, their price is frozen until the end of the auction. Okay, so if dropping you would violate my repacking invariant, you will have this 50 million offer on the table till the end of the auction. At that point, you basically know you are gonna get bought out for 50 million, okay? So now every time you do this, this is a repacking problem, right? So every thought experiment where you say, if this person dropped out, would I no longer be able to pack everybody? That's an instance of this repacking problem. But there could be two. Two what? In other words, it's not just this one guy who, if he drops out, screws up the repacking, but it could be either A or B, and you wanna keep either A or B, but so you want to, it's not clear, you'll, you'll be happy if either A or B uh, were willing to sell. Right. But not necessarily A and not necessarily B. So if you stop, if you give them the money, you didn't need them both, you only needed one of them. That's right. So, you could, so there's a question of, right. So the way the auction works is they literally just go through the bidders one by one. So at any given time, the auction is deciding on only one uh, bidder. And it's basically doing kind of worst case analysis over what might happen in the future. But I mean, but to be clear, stations are only dropping out. So your repacking problem is only getting harder. You know, so once someone is critical, they're really critical, no matter what happens for the rest of the auction. You're gonna need to buy them out no matter what else happens. Okay, so 
that's the repacking problem and it's happening literally every round of this auction. Okay, so thousands of these need to be done every day. So let me give you a picture of this, of this repacking problem just to make sure it's clear. So here, each circle here represents one particular broadcaster. The circle is, is the area of their coverage. The colors here correspond to channels, okay, their current channels. You'll notice that no two overlapping circles share a color, okay, and that's because, you know, no two stations which overlap in their broadcasting area can share a channel. Actually, they can't even share an adjacent channel. But let's leave that aside, okay? So you could ask, okay, three channels, could we repack them in only two channels? Well, definitely not, because over here, we have three mutually overlapping stations. Okay, so we really need three different channels to uh, have none of them interfere with each other. On the other hand, imagine that we bought out this big station on the upper right. Now, it's still the case that all three channels are being used, but now we can actually reassign them onto only two channels so that there's still no interference, okay? So that's the repacking problem in picture, all right? You wanna buy out, you wanna make enough of these circles disappear, buy out enough people, so that the remaining circles, the stations keeping their license, can be colored in the target number of colors, say four, okay? So that's the repacking problem. I said that we had to do, you know, the auction has to do thousands of these every day. And this is obviously an NP-hard problem. Now, this is basically exactly the graph coloring problem. You could just plop this into an algorithms course as a real life application of graph coloring, which it is, okay? So how are we gonna solve thousands of graph coloring problems a day? So Milgram and Segal, they recruited a computer scientist, Kevin Layton Brown at UBC. Uh, to lead this effort, and something really cool turned out to be true, which is that state-of-the-art techniques for solving MP-complete problems, specifically SAT problems, turn out to be sufficient and also sort of necessary to make this a viable auction format, to solve these repacking problems sufficiently quickly that you can actually implement uh, the auction in a reasonable amount of time. So, you know, the, so the approach was first you formulate these graph coloring type problems as SAT problems, if you just use the state-of-the-art off-the-shelf solvers, they do reasonably well. You know, so they, they already kind of solve maybe say 90% of the relevant, relevant instances in a second or less. That, that was roughly the amount they were willing to target, uh, tolerate a second of computation for one of these problems. But uh, you know, so by, using, by leveraging the domain-specific structure of this problem, uh, Leighton Brown and his team was able to get it up to more like 99% okay, of these repacking problems that come up get solved in a second or less. There's still a few of these repacking problems that come up where they time out. The, the sort of stylized, the specialized SAT solver doesn't solve it in one second. In that case, you just sort of pretend as if it's uh, unsatisfiable, which it may or may not be. Because remember, what is a repacking problem? You're asking, can you or can you not successfully reassign all of these stations that have dropped out to a given number of channels? And you know, you really, it, it's not okay to, to make a mistake in the, uh, in the direction of saying yes when the answer is actually no. So what's funny here is that I've never seen a more direct link between the running time performance of an algorithm and the money which gets made or lost. It's like a literally super direct connection because every time the SAT solver fails to find a satisfying assignment to a satisfiable SAT instance, that is a case where the auction is unable to lower somebody's offer price, usually by millions of dollars, when, if only they had found the satisfying assignment, they could have lowered their offer price by millions of dollars, therefore paying less at the end of the auction. So every sad instance, every satisfiable sad instance that you fail to solve in one second kind of directly leads to, you know, a corresponding millions of dollars of loss in, uh, or increase in cost. Okay? So why is it just one second? After all such lowering, you have to give that person whatever time to decide on their offer, right? Or is it like, uh, is the decision instantaneous? Do they just keep their minimum price and immediately respond? No, so they're a round. So, so in a given day, there will be two or three rounds, each lasting you know, two to three hours. Um, and as a bidder, you go once per, per round. But you have, to, you have to cover all the bidders in a given round. And so every bidder has their own repacking problem. Um, and so that's why you have lots of these that need to be solved. So you need to solve order of thousands of them in a couple hours, basically. So for every, I, I will, for yeah. every bidder, you have to. 
the feud they're pecking order. And I mean, and they certainly experimented with different thresholds, right? Because you, you can play with how many rounds you have a day. I mean, and all these are parameters you can play with. They, they wound up deciding on a second. But certainly, but like a minute would certainly not have been okay. That would have been not, that, that would not have been enough. Two seconds, so sure, I'm sure they could have done that. Um, but yeah, so they were getting, you know, sort of diminishing returns, I think. So if you didn't solve it in a second, the SAT solver would often take much longer than a second. But millions, a little like with a faster computer, I imagine. Say it again? Uh, they could also use maybe some faster hardware. Well, they're, so used, so much they're, money they're, they're, they're kind of maxed out on computing maxed power, out. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like that was the easiest part was to buy a whole bunch of machines, right? <laughs> then you had to do the, the algorithms. So good. Okay, so and again I want to emphasize this auction format would literally not be viable. You literally could not run this auction, which just finished last month, without the state of the art technology for solving empty complete problems. Are set solvers public or do you go buy a set solver and I see I bet even a better set solver they pay me lots of money? Many of these are public. It's not like CPLEX. Yeah. So they, so they started from, you know, so they have these SAT competitions, and those are generally, most of those you can um, just work with. It, it varies, but, but um, yeah, but there are good ones which are, which are, you can just use. So it's not a good business to go into make the world's best SAT solver and sell it to people? Uh, you know, I, I could imagine that, you know, if you had a, a, a one particularly good for some important domain like model checking or, you know, chip verification, maybe you could do something. Um, but just as far as general purpose, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, yeah. Okay, uh, so let me just mention one other thing quickly, uh, a little bit more on the theoretical side, around the reverse auction before I move on to the forward auction part. Um, so there's still, there's still flexibility in the auction f format as I've described it, namely, you know, what are these opening prices, who do you decrease next, by how much do you decrease them? And so Milgram and Segal proved a really nice theorem which maps out that design space of exactly, you know, uh, you know what are the different ways you could do, implement this descending clock option. And what they proved is that they essentially correspond to all possible reverse greedy algorithms. So let me talk about what I mean by reverse greedy algorithm. I'm not, I could give you a formal definition, I'm not going to. It's just easier to think of an example. So as an example, think about the minimum spanning tree problem. Okay, so I'll give you a graph with edge costs. You want the spanning tree, the, uh, spanning tree the graph with the cheapest possible sum of edge costs. You've all seen Kruskal's algorithm at some point in your life. This is the MST algorithm where you sort the edges from cheapest to most expensive. You do a single pass through the edges and you keep including an edge as long as it doesn't destroy feasibility, as long as it doesn't create a cycle. And Kruskal's algorithm is correct. It's guaranteed to give you an MST. So that's what I mean by a normal greedy algorithm. By a reverse greedy algorithm, I mean instead of going through the edges in one pass from cheapest to most expensive, you go the opposite direction. You go from most expensive to cheapest. And now you, start, you think about starting with all of the edges and deleting an edge unless it destroys feasibility or until you get feasibility back. Okay? So as long as an edge is on a cycle, you delete it and you continue. And it turns out, you may have never thought about this algorithm, but this algorithm is, is equally correct. It has the same output as Kruskal's algorithm. It doesn't matter whether you do forward or reverse, okay? And there's some other examples where it doesn't matter whether you do forward or reverse. So at the moment, maybe it doesn't sound like that interesting a question. Like we understand a lot about greedy algorithms. Milgram and Segal prove that it's these reverse greedy algorithms. Probably it's the same as greedy algorithms, so we kind of know what's up. Actually, not so much. So uh, this was Paul Dudding and Vasilis Gazelis. We studied the power and limitations of reverse greedy algorithms, okay? And uh, what we discovered is actually there's plenty of basic problems where if you just take the obvious normal greedy algorithm and reverse it in this way, it's a total disaster. For example, matching, even bipartite matching, okay? So, so you, can, you can solve matching uh, with a normal greedy algorithm, a forward greedy algorithm. You go through the edges from highest weight to lowest weight. You always pick an edge if it doesn't violate the fact that it's a matching. That's well known to give a one half approximation in the worst case. What would be the reverse version of that greedy algorithm? You'd start with all the edges, go from the worst to the best, and delete an edge as long as, and, uh, sorry, until you recovered feasibility, until you wound up with a matching. Okay? And that can be a disaster, okay? even in a very simple case. So imagine you have an eight cycle, and all the edges had weight one. Okay? So you start with all the edges. This is not a matching, this eight cycle. So you need to delete an edge. If everything has the same weight, you know, you're, not, you're going to delete some arbitrary edge. You don't know which one. So now you're left with this path of length seven. It's still not a matching. So you're still going to go and delete an edge. 
And again, you, you're given no guidance about which edge to delete, so maybe that's the next edge you delete. And you keep going. You still don't have a matching, you delete again, you still don't have a matching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the reverse greedy algorithm actually doesn't terminate until it deletes all but one edge. That's the first time it actually has a feasible matching. And obviously this is very far from the max weight matching, okay? So this just shows that, uh, you know, MST is the happy case where forward and reverse is the same. There are other problems where the reverse version of the natural greedy algorithm is terrible, okay? And remember, the point of the milgram segal theorem says that descending clock auctions really require reverse greedy algorithms. All right. So I won't go into too much detail here, but just so we did, so what we thought about was, could you have a more clever reverse greedy algorithm which matches the performance of the normal greedy algorithm for, let's say, matching problems, okay, both in graphs and in hypergraphs? And the answer is yes. So the obvious reverse greedy algorithm is not, does not get within a constant factor approximation, but if you work harder, if you do kind of a two-phase approach, then there are techniques that will get you uh, within a constant factor approximation. So growing linearly with the hypergraph rank D. Okay. And, you know, what I think is cool here is, you know, reverse greedy algorithms have been studied before, but barely. You know, a handful of papers uh, kind of scattered through the literature. And, you know, I understand why, right? So reverse greedy algorithms seem harder, they seem less intuitive, harder to design than normal greedy algorithms. They seem to often have worse performance. So why would you ever bother? Right, why not just do a normal greedy algorithm? But here coming from this auction application, we see that because reverse greedy algorithms are the only ones that fit in to this descending clock auction format, it's actually the first extrinsic motivation to study this class of algorithms, reverse greedy algorithms. And I think there's some nice, nice theory problems there. Okay, so I want to move on to the forward auction. Any questions on the reverse part? No, you can't. You're doing kind of worst case analysis. You're basically saying like, you do the thought experiment, what if they dropped out? Would I be screwed? <laughs> like, would I no longer be able to repack everybody? So at, at every point, you calculate once anybody for each possible one. Yeah, exactly. Now, in the implementation, there's a lot of actually really nice caching ideas, so that you wind up getting a lot of um, SAT problems where you can just look up, you know, do table lookup on the solution. Um, but still, there's, uh, there's, a lot that, there's a lot of cache misses too, which they have to solve. So yeah, there's a lot of, that's, that's where the one second comes from. You really have to solve tons of these problems. To what extent can the, uh, the bidders, the companies, be strategic in deciding whether to accept it or not? And rather than just, if they, the obvious thing to do is they have a simple threshold in mind, I want to get at least $30 million, <coughs> just wait till then. But can they be more strategic than that? Good question. So it, it sort of depends on, you know, what uh, space of strategies you're thinking about. I mean, if you're thinking about just the strategies where you're saying yes or no at different points, then there's nothing, there's really no reason to not do, and it's very strong sense, there's no reason not to do the obvious thing, right? Because what, what are the two things that could happen if you deviate? Either you could say no, um, uh, you know, too early, uh, in which case you might have missed out on the opportunity to get paid a ton of money for your license, or you stayed in too long in which case you run the risk of actually getting bought out for this amount, which is less than you know, what you're willing to pay for it is. Now, if you zoom out a little bit and you're like, well, you know, maybe there's ways of strategizing kind of outside the box of the auction, then certainly there are opportunities and, and people are, you, know, you, you can see people strategizing. For example, uh, you could buy a different station, okay? And so then in effect, you get to place bids as two different people in the auction. So it's, it's somehow implicit collusion uh, to buy a second station. You can try to coordinate how those two that's things legal. work against each other. Say it again? That's legal. That's, it's also collusion, but it's a legal collusion. It's, it's yeah, legal. it's kind of a legal workaround, yeah. I mean, there are, there are regulations on sort of how many stations any one entity can own in a given geographic region. It's often only one, or sometimes maybe two. Um, so that limits it to some degree, but um, there have been, I think, some strategic sort of mergers and buyouts uh, in advance of the auction. Yeah. And then, uh, frankly, there's also just like, been just a ton of lobbying, right? So like, for example, someone asked about, you know, how, do these, how are these opening offers calculated? I mean, there was just huge arguments over that. And there's a very, there's a strong, 
you know, there's a, there's a pretty strong uh, lobby group for the television broadcasters. So they, of course, wanted higher offer prices, and the government was trying to push back with lower offer prices. So all of that kind of negotiation in advance of the auction is also going on. So there's lots of strategy, but you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you narrow in the just a limited enough range of things, then this auction actually has very good incentive properties. You really should just do the obvious thing. And of course, the hope is that you know, the, the ultimate outcome will be dominated you know, by you know, television broadcasters that just kind of uh, participate in the obvious way. That's the hope. So. Okay, other questions? All right, so the forward auctions. Remember, this, this is what happens second. So, and so just to, to, as far as where we're at, so the reverse auction, or at least the first stage of the reverse auction concluded about a month ago. And the forward auction is starting literally a week from today. Okay, so that's where they're gonna start taking bids. Um, I think there's 62 qualified bidders or something like that participating in the forward auction, um, bidding, on, bidding on licenses, okay? As I said, these auctions have been around for a long time, early 90s, and they work pretty well, so no one's really looking to, to do much with the design. Okay, mostly people have just been using sort of the standard workhorse for auction after auction over the last 20 years. But so here, where computer science has contributed is really in the analysis, in taking uh, rules of thumb, which are you know, widely believed in practice, but l have not been formalized. And it turns out the theoretical computer science toolbox is perfect for turning these rules of thumb into translating them into, into precise guarantees, precise theorems. All right, so a little bit about the, how these forward auctions work. Uh, you know, so we've been mentioning that you know, there's, a, there's big numbers involved, tens of billions of dollars in these things. And then what makes it kind of even more um, scary is that the design really matters. So if you use a bad auction design, it can perform extremely poorly. So there's a cautionary tale uh, from the early days, New Zealand in 1990. So here the New Zealand government was selling um, the rights for 10 different television channels, interchangeable. And they decided to sell these 10 channels using 10 uh, simultaneous second price auctions. So a, se a single second price auction is like what happens on eBay. The winner is the highest bidder, and the selling price uh, is the second highest bid. Okay, so that's a second price auction. So they decided to just do a sealed bid second price auction simultaneously for all 10 of these channels. So as a participant in this auction, you will write down 10 numbers what is your bid for each of the 10 channels? And then each channel is just awarded independently. So you just look at the highest bidder on that channel and the second highest bid on that channel and that determines the winner and the price. But you don't want to win twice though. Generally not. So, and, that, and in this case, the bidders didn't really want to win more than one. So that would suggest you write down nine zeros right. and then a non-trivial number on one of them. Right. Yeah. So, but it's under your control to not win more you than bid once. twice, you possibly could really. Exactly. So, so, so this is, this is exactly where I'm going. So, so if you think about it, imagine you were a participant in this auction. It's actually not super obvious what you should do, especially if you knew there are only about 20 participants in this auction. So it's actually not very competitive uh, as far as the ratio of bidders to channels. So you know, what, maybe the simplest thing you might try to do is so suppose you only wanted one channel, like Ron said. Uh, you could say, well, let me just sort of pick my favorite channel, like channel number seven, and go all in. I'm just going to bid my you know, willingness to pay on the one channel and hope I get it. It's not the only strategy, right? You could also say, well, you know, there's only 20 people after these 10 channels. So if they're kind of, you know, load back, you know, if they're like randomly, you know, picking different channels to bid on, maybe there's going to be some channel with like zero or one people who are bidding on it. And so maybe I should just bid super low on multiple channels, hoping I get one of them for a bargain, okay? And hoping that I don't win all of them and have to pay for all but of them. If you win two of them at a bargain, that's okay too. Exactly, depending on where the price is for your value, that's right. So that could be a legitimate strategy, um, bidding low on lots of, lots of. Presumably you could then sell it to somebody else so you get an extra channel. Possibly, yeah. I mean, there's, there's issues around that, but. Uh, um, so, okay. Uh, right, so it's not clear how to bid. And a good rule of thumb is, in an auction where it's not clear what you should do as a bidder, has very high variability and unpredictability in the outcome. And you can suffer a lot, both in terms of the revenue and in terms of just the quality of the allocation that you attain. So in this New Zealand auction, for example, they were hoping to make a quarter of a billion dollars. They made less than, f and that was the estimate, they made less than 15% of that. Okay, so they made 36 million instead of 250 million. And you know, when you sort of 
look into the details of this auction, it, it's really kind of cringe-inducing to see the details. Like there was one channel where the high bid was 250,000. That's already like really bad news because you notice they're hoping to make 25 mil per channel. So I'm telling you the highest bid was 250,000 on this channel. The second highest bid was six. Not 6,000, just six. Six dollars? <laughs> six dollars. <laughs> and I, I don't know why, but they didn't use a reserve price. I mean, oh my gosh, the guy got it for six bucks. Yeah, guy got it for six bucks. There's another channel where the high bid actually was 25 million, but the second highest bid was sort of, you know, 50,000, something like that. It was worth 250,000 of them, so it made it possible. It was worth 250,000 and you only had to pay six. By the way, it made it problem. Excuse me? The guy who paid six dollars was willing to pay 250, right? 250,000. Maybe. Which means Hard to say. That's, that's how, much, how much money was left on the table. No, and you said they, the, the highest bid was 250,000, right? Right. And you got it for six? Right. No, that I agree with. Yeah. So, so it's clear, it's, it's, uh, there's a lower bound, certainly, on how much money was left on the table. Um, and right, this is what I was getting at. So at insult to injury, the contract of this auction required the government to report both the high bid and the selling price on every one of the auctions. So these spreads were just obvious to, to the whole world after this happened. So it's kind of a high stakes thing, right? Big numbers and bad designs uh, are really, you know, are, are really problematic. And of course, in the US auctions, you know, we're scaling these numbers up by two orders of magnitude. All right, so people don't use these sealed bid simultaneous formats. So what do they use? Well, they use kind of a simple twist on it, which is simultaneous ascending auctions. So what's a single ascending auction? That's what you'd see at Christie's or Sotheby's, where there's some auctioneer maintaining a price, the price only goes up, you raise your hand as long as you want it, and as soon as there's only one person who's still raising their hand, they're the winner at the, most recent, at the most recently announced price by the auctioneer. So for simultaneous ascending auctions, you just have one of these running in parallel on each of the items that's being sold. Okay? So in a spectrum auction, you're gonna have one price per license, and all of these prices are only going up, and as a bidder, you can stay in on whatever subset of these licenses you see fit. Okay? And then again, they're just allocated separately. So when there's only one person left interested in the license, it gets allocated at the most recent price. So this, and so, and this does much better in practice than, than sealed bid formats, you know, basically because you know, there's, there's room for bidders to coordinate implicitly as the auction proceeds. And of course, you can have mid-course corrections as if you realize the competition is sort of higher or lower in certain parts than what you thought. So, the thinking is these work pretty well, but they're not perfect, okay? They do have a couple of vulnerabilities. So let me tell you two, uh, the two biggest vulnerabilities in simultaneous ascending auctions. The first is called demand reduction. And so this is where a bidder will ask for fewer licenses than it actually wants in order to depress the competition and lower the market clearing prices. So let me tell you a specific example. Okay, so suppose there's just two items, two licenses, okay? Suppose you're bidder number one, you're willing to pay six per license, okay? So you're willing to pay six for one license, 12 for both. Suppose I really only want one license, I don't want them both, and I'm willing to pay five for either of the two licenses, okay? Now, on some like moral level, you should get both of the licenses, right? Your value for each six is more than my value for either five, right? So that's sort of what we want to have happen in some sense. <coughs> But how would that actually happen in this ascending auction, right? So for me to get nothing, why, why would I ever drop out in this ascending auction? Again, I'm willing to pay five for either one. I'm only gonna drop out when the price for both of the items is five or more. If either item has priced it below five, I'm gonna stay in and be like, I want that, okay? So I only drop out when both of the prices hit five. At that point, you win both items and you have value 12, six for each, but you pay 10 five for each, so you have a net utility of two. Okay, it's better than nothing. But here's the incentive for demand reduction. Imagine that instead of insisting on going for both licenses, imagine you just bid only on license one and you never bid on license two. I would then say, okay, fine, I'll take license two for free, thank you very much. I won't bother competing with you on license one and you'll get license one for free. So you only get one license instead of two, but because the price has dropped from five to zero, your net utility has gone up from two to six, okay? So that's why decreasing the amount of licenses that you target can decrease competition, leading to lower prices and therefore higher utility, okay? That's demand reduction. Okay, so the second vulnerability 
uh, second price of, of these uh, simultaneous sending auctions is known as the exposure problem. And the exposure problem comes up when there are so-called complementarities between items. So now imagine that you're still bidder number one, but now you really want both of the licenses. For example, maybe one is Northern California and one is Southern California, and you really want to roll out a statewide plan. You really do not want just one license, you really want both. And imagine you're willing to pay six for both, okay, total. Imagine I'm the same as before. I'm willing to pay five for either one. I don't care which one I get, and I don't want both, okay? So again, you know, morally, you should win, right? Because your value for these licenses six is more than mine five. But again, if you think about these ascending auctions, I'm not going to drop out until the price of both hits five. And if you stay in that long to force me out of the auction, think about where things stand. You're going to get both items. You have value six but you pay five for each, you pay 10. Okay, so your utility is minus four. You're worse off than if you'd never showed up to the auction in the first place, okay? So that's the exposure problem. If you're a bidder with these complementarities between items where you really want a whole package and not a subset, um, then you have to either bid aggressively and risk you know, paying more than your value or bid tentatively and then risk you know, not winning what you rightfully deserve. So that's the exposure problem. And so these are well-known issues with simultaneous ascending auctions. So, so I told you some toy examples. You know, do these things actually happen? Yeah, they do happen. So you know, let, let's, let's see what the experts say about this issue. So Peter Crampton, he's an economics professor at University of Maryland, and he's been very active both in the design of these forward spectrum auctions, and he also does a lot of work consulting. Uh, for people who bid in these auctions. And so you know, he's written a number of things about, about how, you know, how they've worked in, in practice. So he starts with an interesting statement, which just says, look, first of all, you know, it's a complex allocation problem we're dealing with, allocating licenses to bidders. You're not going to have full efficiency. You're not going to get the best possible allocation with any reasonable auction format. So in some sense, what he's saying, is the best you could hope for is some kind of near optimal, near optimality, some kind of approximation guarantee. He goes on to say, you know, demand reduction definitely happens. He cites a particular company, PageNet, and he was actually consulting for PageNet during this auction, so he was well positioned to know that they were engaging in demand reduction. And further, he says that, you know, there is inefficiency arising from demand reduction, but at least, you know, in this particular auction, it didn't seem very severe. There was inefficiency, but still the quality of the outcome was not too far away from the best you could hope for, from an optimal allocation. So demand reduction seems to is, you know, definitely exist, but seems to not be such a big deal. The exposure problem, by contrast, seems like kind of a deal breaker for simultaneous ascending auctions. This quote's referring to you know, field, uh, lab experiments rather than field experiments, but still you know, most people believe that if you have these strong complementarities between items where a bidder really wants a bundle and not the individual items, then you're going to have, you're, you're vulnerable to very poor outcomes with simultaneous ascending auctions. So demand reduction exists, but it's not a deal breaker. If you have complementarities, the exposure problem does seem like a deal breaker for this workhorse auction format of simultaneous ascending auctions. So here's how I would summarize the discussion so far. Right, so if you talk to people, who work in the trenches of these forward auctions, you know, maybe there's maybe a little bit of debate, but for the most part, there's a consensus of the following two rules of thumb. So first of all, if there aren't strong complementarities between items, then you can get away with a simple auction format like simultaneous ascending auctions. It should be fine. It's not going to be 100% efficient. Nobody's claiming that, but it should be good enough in some sense. On the other hand, if there are strong complements, then you, re there's really, you really have to add more complexity to the auction beyond just these simultaneous ascending auctions, okay, if you want to have any kind of reasonable outcome. So more complexity here might mean something like adding package bidding, where in addition to um, bidding separately on each item, you can also submit a bid that says, I really want items one, three, and five, and I'm willing to bid, you know, 100, bid 100 for it. Okay, that would be an example of adding complexity to an auction in order to let bidders express any complementarities they might have between the items. So for the rest of this talk, I guess I should wrap up pretty soon, but I want to say a, at least a little bit about each of these, and I want to show you how, in theoretical computer science, 
um, we, you know, naturally lends the vocabulary to translate these rules of thumb into totally precise guarantees, totally precise theorems. So again, these have been known to economists, sort of those working in the trenches for many, many years, but it's been, le it's been left essentially totally unformalized in the economics literature. And if I had to speculate, I would say it's, you know, it's really because, you know, I can't imagine any way of turning these beliefs into theorems which don't involve talking about approximation. And economists just historically have not really thought about approximation guarantees. It's just not been something they do. And so that's why there's been sort of a mismatch between traditional economic theory and kind of theory that would be relevant for understanding these rules of thumb. Okay, so let me say a little bit about each one. So first, we want a positive result. We want to say that if there aren't these complementarities between items, then a simple auction works pretty well. So what would a theorem look like? So I want to think about, you know, the case that Crampton was talking about where you have demand reduction, there is strategic behavior, but somehow the efficiency still seems pretty high. So fundamentally what the theorem is going to be about, it's going to be talking about the result of strategic behavior. It's going to be talking about the equilibria of some auction, okay, so some simple auction format. And the conclusion should be that the equilibria, the result of strategic behavior, is close to optimal with respect to some objective function. Okay, so approximation guarantees for equilibria is actually something that computer scientists have been thinking a lot about over the past 15 years. There's even a catchy name for it, the price of anarchy. Hopefully a few of you have heard about this at some point. Um, if you haven't thought about the price of anarchy in like five years or more, maybe the first picture that comes into your mind is something like this, some kind of network. Maybe, you know, there's selfish routing, maybe there's network formation, something like this. Because in the early days of algorithmic game theory, this, this, this is what the work on price of anarchy was. It was sort of a collection of sort of model-specific analyses for lots of different, you know, usually network-related settings. Last five years, something really cool has happened, which is um, there's really now a very coherent theory of price of anarchy bounds. And there's a powerful and easy to use, frankly, toolbox for proving in many different types of games, including, relevant for us, auctions, that equilibria are guaranteed to be near optimal. So what I want to do next is I want to tell you there's a bunch of results of this form that, that uh, use the price of anarchy to formalize that folklore belief. I'm going to single out one specific one just to make it more concrete, okay? So in these last few slides, you know, I'm not going to do any proofs or anything like that, but I do want to be somewhat precise about the statements. So let me tell you a little bit you know, more formally about the model I'm talking about and the objective function we're approximating and so on. So there's N bidders, M items, you know, think of them as telecoms and, and, spe and, and spectrum licenses. And we need to have a notion of the best allocation, okay, the way to allocate the items to the bidders so that it's most valuable to everybody. So how do we make that precise? Well, we need to have a notion of a bidder's value for one or more items. So we have this notion of a valuation. So each bidder I has a valuation which specifies, and this is sort of just in their mind, it specifies for each subset of licenses they might receive what would be their maximum willingness to pay for that particular subset. Okay, so for licenses one, three, and five, maybe you're willing to pay 12 at most, okay? Notice evaluation specifies two to the M different numbers, okay? One for each subset of the items for sale, one for each bundle that it might receive, okay? So the notion of the best allocation is just going to be the one that maximizes what's known as the social welfare, which is just the sum of the values of all of the bidders, of the items that they receive. So in a perfect world, we would love to distribute, partition the items in a way to make that social welfare as high as possible. That's kind of our utopian benchmark. A bidder, what it wants to do is it wants to maximize its utility, so its value minus the price it has to pay uh, for the items that it receives. And so the question then, so to prove a price of anarchy bound, what it means is to prove that the equilibria of some game, of some auction game, uh, are close to the maximum possible in social welfare. Okay, that's what it means to prove that the price of anarchy is good, that the price of anarchy is close to one. All right, so, what, so let me tell you, what, so this is to tell you what auction format the theorem is going to be about. Um, so we're gonna talk about, for simplicity, simultaneous first price auctions. Uh, we could use second price, there'd be analogous results, it's just simpler to work with the first price case. Um, so this is where the items are sold separately, sealed bids, uh, winner pays their bid. And then the question I want to ask is, you know, when do simultaneous first price auctions have equilibria? 
with nearly the maximum possible welfare. Welfare almost as high as if we could just have a centralized optimization of all of the items. Okay, so that's the question. The folklore beliefs would suggest that the answer will be, it might work well if there are not complements, but it shouldn't work well in general if there are complements. Okay, but again, there were no theorems about this until a few years ago. All right, so the positive results. So, I need to say, so now I need to say, what do I mean formally by there are no complementarities between items? There's several ways of making this precise. One thing that's cool about this theorem is it works with the weakest of all of the definitions people think about for without complements, which is just having a subadditive valuation. Okay, so the only assumption here is that a bidder's value for the union of two bundles is at most the sum of their values for each bundle by itself. So that's a subadditive valuation. That's one way of saying there's no complements. And a, a really great theorem by Feldman, Fu, Graben, and Lucier show that as long as you have subadditive bidder valuation, so no complements in that sense, and under no other assumptions, any equilibrium, so the result of strategic behavior, is going to be within a constant factor of the maximum possible welfare. Okay, so you have this auction, it's a very simple lightweight auction, people reach some equilibrium, and it's going to be guaranteed to be near optimal in this sense. I think it's a constant. So, it's, so in this case, it's 50% in the worst case. And as usual, you know, for in many cases, you expect to do better than the worst case. If you're willing to strengthen the assumption from subadditivity to submodularity, uh, which is a stronger version of having no complements, then actually even the worst case balance <coughs> improves from 50% to one minus one over E, which is roughly 63%. Okay. So this is a sense in which, you know, remember that first folklore belief, without strong complements, i.e. with subadditive valuations, simple auctions work pretty well, i.e. every equilibrium of simultaneous first price auctions is within a constant factor of the maximum possible. Okay, so it's really a direct translation of this belief using the price of energy as a tool. Okay. So that's the formal version of the first rule of thumb, that without complements, simple auctions do well. Let's go, let, let me conclude by talking about the second one. Okay, so the second one says, you know, if there are complementarities between items, so again, people want bundles and not the individual items, then you really need to add complexity to the auction. No simple auction is going to be good enough. So notice, so, so let's again ask, what would a theorem look like here? So here it's, here it's a little different, right? It's a lower bound, it's a negative result, right? We want to prove that for every single simple auction, it's not going to be good, i.e. there will be equilibria with very poor welfare. So we need to rule out the entire class of simple auctions simultaneously, which, you know, if you weren't a computer scientist, might sound pretty intimidating. But of course, it's right in the wheelhouse of theoretical computer science to have techniques that rule out any possible solution to some problem. Okay, we have lots of tools for proving that certain solutions of a certain form do not exist for different problems. And that's basically what we need here. The solution space being simple auctions, and then the problem to be attaining a, a near optimal outcome of the, of the items. Okay. So let's just start by revisiting the auction our positive results about, simultaneous first price auctions. Let's just check that they don't actually, they know, remember they got within a constant factor without complements. The folklore beliefs suggest that they shouldn't without complements, or with complements, with general valuations. And that was shown by Hasselin, Kaplan, Mansur, and Nissan. Okay, so in fact, that constant factor we saw for the subadditive case, it really needs the subadditive assumption. It is just really badly false uh, for general valuations. Okay, so, you know, as you scale the number of items, you're not even guaranteed to get 1% of the maximum welfare uh, in an equilibrium of simultaneous first price auctions. It's something that should be easy to show. You see, it's a big deal. Wouldn't that be easy to show to some simple example to show that? Yeah, that's what this is. I, I wasn't trying to say this was a big deal. I was oh, saying okay. this, this, is the, this is the first sanity check. Okay. Right, so we want to show that all simple auctions are bad. Right. Let's start just with the specific simple auction we proved good results about. Great. And at least that doesn't work. Great. But now, you know, as Ron is suggesting, you know, well, but maybe, maybe we just need to be more clever. Maybe we change first price to second price, or all pay, or maybe we let people bid on pairs of items and not just single items. Right? Why, why wouldn't one of these perhaps work? Uh, but in fact, it can't. Okay, so you can really prove, um, this is unconditional, um, that when bidders have general valuations, when they have complements, actually every single simple auction, I'll have to tell you what I mean by that, but every single simple auction has, in the worst case, equilibria arbitrarily far from the maximum possible welfare. There is no simple auction that guarantees a constant fraction of the optimal welfare okay. when you have complements. In this sense, simple auctions perform poorly 
with complementarities. So what do I mean by simple? Uh, by simple, I just mean that there aren't too many bidding parameters per bidder. All right, so let's think about this for a second. So let's say it's simultaneous first price auctions. How many bidding parameters are there? Well, I submit one bid on each of the M items. Okay, so those M bidding parameters and simultaneous first price auctions. If I could also submit on pairs of items, then it would be M squared and so on. On the other hand, you know, like what's the m biggest number of bidding parameters you could possibly imagine? Well, I kind of only have two to the M things to say, right? I have this valuation which specifies what I, what, what I, how I value each of the possible bundles. I guess in the extreme case, I could tell you all two to the M numbers. And indeed, if you did that, then there's an analog of the second price auction which actually would get full efficiency. Okay, so once you get exponential, it's not gonna be the case that things don't work well. They can work well. It's not gonna be implementable for m modest M, but in principle, it does get full efficiency. So simple here just means you're not at this extreme case of having an exponential number of bidding parameters. If you have M parameters, M squared parameters, two to the root M parameters, whatever, it's not gonna be good enough. Okay, so any auction with just a sub-exponential, just a sub-exponential number of bids per player is going to suffer from arbitrarily poor equilibria. That sounds hard to prove. It's not too hard to prove. No? Well, nah, I'll, I'll give you a sketch. I'll give you a, a one slide plausibility argument. Yeah, Vitaly. So can you explain why having some equilibria which are bad, is, or is it just, just this is the kind of result you're going, why, why does it mean that necessarily that whatever I'll run, uh, when I run those uh, auctions, yeah. I'll reach those bad equilib equilibria? Yeah, so, so the statement's a little more general. So it actually says, suppose you have any you know, special case of an equilibrium, which is um, tractable to verify. So this is sort of the property of an equilibrium that I need for the theorem. I needed that if you wrote down an alleged equilibrium, I could in say poly communication or something like that, verify it as such. So a non-example would be, you know, if you said this is the maximum welfare equilibrium, how would I know that, right? How do, how do I know there isn't one that's bigger? I, I just can't find it. So, I would argue that any, any kind of useful equilibrium concept, if I equate you know, certifiability as a you know, necessary condition for you know, relevance, then this theorem holds no matter what it is. We are talking about the, sort of the solution which result from some process. Exactly. Would it necessarily, I mean, why would, be, why would we be using a process which result in solutions which have some verifiable property? Well, I guess, I, mean, I wouldn't say it's, it's not the case that it, I'm not assuming any process for reaching an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying, you know, if people reach an equilibrium, no matter how they do it, even using an exponential amount of communication and time and all this kind of stuff, it's still going to be the case that, you know, it's not going to achieve uh, good welfare. So that's, that's kind of the strength of it. So if I was somehow assuming that bidders were only doing poly communication to get wherever they get, then these results would be much more immediate. So somehow even, so the point of the error result says, even if I allow you the power to magically jump to an equilibrium, still, you're still not gonna get an approximation of the maximum wealth. Okay, um, anyway, so before I say maybe just a minute about the argument, uh, let me just point out, I think this is a quite direct translation to that second folklore belief, that without strong complements, you really have no choice but to add complexity to the auction format if you want good welfare guarantees at least in the good case, at least in the worst case. Okay, um, so, let me just, so let me just say kind of one word about how it goes, um, because in particular, this result piggybacks on some really nice work that's been done in communication complexity last decade. And so you know, I think a lot, a lot of you know, people who don't work in complexity think of communication complexity as sort of this kind of very esoteric, difficult, you know, strand of, strand of theoretical of science. And there are aspects which are, but it's actually exactly what you need to turn this empirical rule of thumb into a theorem. It's actually exactly the right tool. It's really cool, actually. So, the, the, so my theorem is, is more general in the following sense. It's a translation of lower bounds for communication protocols to lower bounds for equilibria. So whenever you can prove that there's no communication protocol with, with certain properties, for obtaining a near optimal allocation of the items, it will automatically follow this, from this theorem. So this theorem will say it will automatically follow that that same lower bound you prove for protocols also holds for equilibrium. 
And again, the reason this is non-trivial is because I'm not assuming that the equilibrium is computed by some low-cost protocol. So even if you magically get to an equilibrium, it's still the case that the lower bound that we've proved for protocols applies for equilibria. Okay. Equilibria of simple auctions, I should say, excuse me. Okay. So the lower bound applies for auctions that have a sub-exponential number of bidding parameters. And so then, then I just use the fact that actually last decade there's a lot of nice work that really do say there are not low-cost communication protocols for these welfare maximization problems, even approximately. So for example, with general valuations, you cannot in a reasonable amount of communication, even non-deterministic communication, achieve any kind of constant factor approximation. If you combine that lower bound on protocols with my theorem on the translation, it tells you then that no simple auction can get a constant fraction of the optimal welfare at equilibrium. Is 2 to the m minus 1 sub-exponential? No, it's, uh, there's some constant there. So, so the proof works up to 2 to the cm for some constant c which my guess is is like a quarter or something like that. But I didn't try to optimize that constant. So it's, it's possible you might be able to compress it a little bit. I don't know. So, yeah, but certainly you can't, th there's some constant C such that you can't do better than two to, like less than two to the CM is not good enough, will not be good enough. Yeah. Okay, so, so anyways, the high order bit here is, you know, there's nice work by other people done last decade saying communication protocols cannot, with minimum cost, with, with low cost, compute um, near optimal allocations, and therefore by this general translation theorem, uh, equilibria can't do that either. So that's how you prove it. So, you know, wrapping up, you know, I think this is a very exciting time to be working in this area, the interface of economics and computation. I mean, for 15 years, there's been really cool research going on, but really this decade, I think we're starting to see kind of a major impact uh, out in the real world from the ideas that have been coming out uh, from this community. So I just picked one case study. I just picked the 2016 FCC incentive auctions. Obviously, there's other case studies uh, I could have chosen as well. Um, and here I tried to highlight two things. So first of all, in the reverse auction, which is the new part, which got actually there was freedom to design over the past few years, computer science played a crucial role in what auction was chosen to implement and how it was implemented. Really, without computer science techniques, some other auction would have been run uh, a few months ago. And then on the forward auction side, there aren't a lot of sort of opportunities these days to influence design, but still there are these, you know, 20 year old rules of thumb for people who work in the trenches lacking formalization and the price of anarchy for the upper bounds and communication complexity for the lower bounds is exactly the right language to turn those into rigorous guarantees. So I'm very optimistic we'll see you know, a lot more kind of high impact applications of the field uh, in the years to come. Thanks very much. Economists feel about computer scientists. Are they are they eternally grateful, or are they using the steel or how do they feel about it? I would say I would say in general, I've been extremely impressed with how collegial economists and game theorists have been, especially in the early days. Um, computer scientists kind of really. You know, we were making a lot of blunders, right? We sort of, uh, you know, we were kind of reinventing the wheel periodically in the early days of algorithmic game theory. And, um, you know, rather than the usual hostility and disdain that I think you get from some other field, I mean, my experience has been just, has been very open, very patient, you know, saying maybe you should read chapter four of this textbook and then come talk to me again. And, and just, but with it, when they were right, you know. Um, and so, and I think they're, you know, I think they've been, in general, very open-minded, especially the best economists that, that I've met. I think they've been you know, especially open-minded. And, you know, some of the stuff that we do they like, some of it they don't like, but that, they're fine with that, and they cherry-pick the parts that they do like and incorporate into their own research, and, and I think that's a, that's a healthy relationship. I mean, we do the same thing with economics literature. There are parts that we as computer scientists sort of reject for various reasons and other parts that we build on. Um, so, I, you know, as far as, you know, two previously totally, more or less totally unrelated fields, you know, John von Neumann notwithstanding, um, you know, I think it's been unusually successful collaboration, unusually friction-free, actually. So. Do you write papers with economists? Okay. I, so I, I don't write very many with economists. I mean, I'll, you know, so, you know, I'll send them my papers for comments and vice versa, um, but we tend to ask different questions, so. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> Yeah. Can you comment on the role of technology in timing of the auctions? In timing of the auctions. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, 
I, you know, my sense was, I mean, I think th this may change, but my sense was historically, it's been more logistical and economic drivers determining the timing of, say, these forward auctions, when they were just doing forward auctions over and over again. Um, you know, there was, it seemed like there was a roughly regular schedule of how often they do it. Um, you know, I, you could imagine, you know, so this came up earlier, you could ask, you know, are, is there ever going to be another double auction of this form? If so, when? And, you know, what will be the stakes then? Will they be higher or lower? So certainly, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the cost of buying back spectrum just keeps going up, you know, because there's kind of less of it. And so then it would suggest, you know, that you need, you know, on the, on the buyer side, you need to have that much more value you can extract from it which presumably would be enabled by, you know, some kind of new technologies. So on that level, you know, again, this is just speculative, but I could imagine, you know, new technologies being the essential motivation for doing this again five years from now or eight years from now or whatever. Um, I, I, you know, I, this is a little outside my expertise, but I haven't seen evidence that that's been what's driving it thus far as much. So, so thanks again. Okay. And, and also